Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shabin. Welcome to uh, Critical Care's Pathway today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Travis Murphy today speaking with us from, it's going to be a long title, the Miami Transplant Institute at University of Miami slash Jackson Memorial down in Miami. Uh, he's been a great mentor for me for the past few years, and now he's going to bring his expertise in vasopressors and other critical care topics and give us a quick lecture about it today. So please uh, welcome Dr. Murphy. Thanks, Shaman. Thank you for a very nice introduction. I'm looking forward to talking with everybody about something that is going to be uh, pertinent to the, the rest of your career in handling any kind of critically ill patients. So uh, vasoactive agents and then sort of when and why to use them. So what we're going to talk about today um, some of the, the differentiation of the lingo between what a vasopressor is or an inotrope, some of those things that you'll hear throughout the hospital in your training, uh, describing where these are intended to work and the receptors that we're targeting, and different reasons to use different agents. So we'll go through a brief discussion of the different types of shock, and then applying the appropriate uh, vasoactive medication based on what we're trying to achieve and what's going on with the patient. Uh, so first, we'll go over some vocabulary. Uh, and when you hear the term presser, so in, in the strictest sense, this is something that uh, constricts uh, peripheral vessels specifically, uh, more arteries, uh, sometimes arteries and veins, uh, depending on the agent. Uh, the idea here is to, to clamp down and increase the pressure within that tubular structure, which is the arteries, um, to, to increase flow and blood flow to these organs. Um, but with this technique, there are some, some inherent limitations. The other the terms that you'll hear uh, are inotropes, and these are medications that are designed to uh, increase the, the force with which the heart muscle itself squeezes. So it acts on the cardiomyocytes, increases the contractility, and the duration of systole. So just squeezes a little bit harder and a little bit longer. Uh, chronotropes, you may hear, are uh, agents that increase the, the heart rate, so causing the heart rate uh, to increase. Dromotropes, increase the, the rate of conduction down uh, the conductive system within the heart, so through the AV node, down the bundle of his and the Purkinje fibers. And lucitropes are agents that increase relaxation in diastole, so to allow the heart to fill just a little bit more, and, and that requires active use of ATP to do. Uh, so these medications allow the heart to do that. And a combination term is an inodilator. We'll talk some more about these later. Uh, are agents that are inotropes that increase the contractility of the myocardium itself, but also act to decrease the peripheral resistance. So it you know, opens up peripheral vessels so that as the heart's squeezing with more force, there's less resistance downstream and increases the output. So the receptors that we're targeting uh, with each of these medications, we'll discuss some of those now to know uh, and put it all together and what we want to achieve in each clinical scenario. So alpha-1 receptors are responsible for vasoconstriction. Uh, there's some elements of the glyconeogenesis, the madriasis. It's not something that you would notice clinically, but, but on the, in a physiology lab, this is what you'll see. Uh, things to know most pertinent clinically are vasoconstriction and, and sphincter contraction uh, to a certain degree. Alpha-2 receptors are responsible for vasodilation. On the other hand, so these are your opposites of each other. Uh, there's a reflex bradycardia with them, some sedation. I mean, this is why we use medications like dexmedetomidine and your Presidex. It acts in the alpha-2 receptors. Uh, and you'll see some, uh, some reflex bradycardia and hypertension with that as well. Uh, and then some element of GI uh, relaxation and decreased insulin production. But that's not something that is clinically significant. Beta-1 receptors uh, are your, your fight-or-flight response, so it increases your heart rate, the contractility, your, the conduction through the myocardium. Uh, it stimulates renin release, so it increases blood pressure through that mechanism as well, and it encourages some amount of vasodilation to uh, improve cardiac output. So as you're running away from a saber-toothed tiger, that you know, you're able to meet your body's metabolic demands. Uh, beta-2 receptors are those you might be familiar with from, from asthma and treatments. Uh, relaxes the smooth muscles, such as in bronchioles. Uh, causes some vasodilation, uterine relaxation, uh, and stimulates some insulin production. Uh, but again, that's sort of a uh, modest, uh, modest effect clinically. The vasopressin receptors uh, are notably absent in the lungs. 
uh, and act only on the peripheral vasculature. Uh, and this is something that will increase you know, the pressure within those pipes, uh, in increase to a certain extent some renal water retention. Uh, so this is medications like desmopressin uh, that sometimes are used uh, for uh, nighttime bedwetting, um, you use it to that effect. Uh, but when we're giving it in, in critically ill patients in IV form, this really is a very potent uh, peripheral vascular uh, constrictor. Uh, and also acts on you know, not just the, the vessels in your arms and legs, but also the vessels that feed uh, your gut and your GI system. So that, that's something you have to consider. Uh, we'll talk about in a little moment. The dopamine receptors are present throughout the body uh, and uh, have a variety of actions. Um, the well, classical thinking is that it's dose dependent. And while that's, that's somewhat true in a physiology lab kind of level, in a clinical sense, you don't really get those same effects. So it, it used to be decades ago that you would titrate dopamine uh, to renal dose or, or peripheral vascular dose, uh, and that hasn't really materialized uh, in the clinical settings. So we use different agents nowadays, um, but these uh, receptors and those that are related to them are the basis from a lot of the different pressors that we'll use. So the question then is, when do we need to start pressors? Uh, and that at times when a patient's in shock. So defining shock, uh, is going to be uh, important to conceptualize what, what it really means. So typically you'll hear shock as a term of low blood pressure, uh, but really it's more of a mismatch between the oxygen that's being provided and, and the body's ability to receive it. So more, for, more so than a blood pressure, we look for these markers of end organ perfusion. So uh, patients with a ventricular assist device may live with a mean arterial pressure down in the 50s. And there's older adults that may live with a, blood, a systolic blood pressure in the 200s. And if they were to correct to the normal 140 over 80, it would cause different problems for each of those populations. So, so that number is important, but it's important to be viewed within context. So it's more about getting oxygen where it needs to go and making sure that the end organs can use it rather than fixing that number itself. So the markers that we use, you can see here, uh, are ways that we can tell, uh, apart from the blood pressure cuff for the arterial line, that and the supply-demand ratio of oxygen is going to be appropriate. So this is a diagram I like to bring up uh, to go over the different types of shock that you, you'll encounter. Uh, there's really you know, four families and five if you include a mixed shock, which can be any combination of these. Uh, but starting off, we have hypovolemic shock, distributive, cardiogenic, or obstructive. And within these, these uh, main types of shock, there's, there's subsets. Typically, some that have to do with the volume within your patient or the output of, of the uh, heart itself. So volume loss, uh, is hypovolemic shock, you know, whether it be from bleeding to death, you know, trauma, or just dehydration after running a marathon, or volume shifts, like in distributive shock, that you might see in excess or, or uh, a neurogenic event. Sorry, did it cut out there? No, you're good. And, uh, your camera went away, but you're, you're still on. Okay. So the distributive shock is is uh, in this family. So sepsis, anaphylaxis, or, or neurogenic, where uh, the vas vasculature has dilated for either inflammatory reasons or, or neurogenic tone, and now you have volume shifted out of the vasculature into the peripheral tissues. For cardiogenic shock, you have you know, myocardial issues like a, a myocardial infarction, a conduction problem, uh, or stenosis or regurgitation of those valves. And obstructive shock is that it's putting pressure on the heart itself. So tamponade, or pneumothorax, a tension pneumothorax, or pulmonary emboli. Uh, so conceptualizing which type of shock that your patient is experiencing will help you determine which of these uh, agents you need to use. Uh, and if it's not evident initially clinically uh, with the values that you have, a good way that we can use, especially in the emergency department, is a, a quick uh, assessment with ultrasound. Um, this, this deserves its own lecture, so I won't dive into it too deeply, but this is a sequence of views on the ultrasound that you can, you can really tell within a matter of a minute or two what's going on with your patient, what's going to be the main driver here. So with that, we take our knowledge of, of what type of shock we're dealing with and the, the capabilities of these different medications, and we use that to apply it to each scenario. So uh, most most of the medications are, you know, it's not inherently perfect, but they'll have some 
a combination of features. And sometimes we need to use a mix of these uh, to achieve our intended goal. So if we need to increase the system vascular resistance or the mean arterial pressure, uh, we might use more pressing agents. So things like vasopressin or phenylephrine. Uh, if we need some elements of inotropy, we'll use things like uh, milrinone or dibutamine uh, and to a certain extent, epinephrine and dopamine. Uh, but a combination of these is really what's going to uh, be helpful in targeting uh, the type of uh, shock that we're, we're dealing with. So when would we use each of these agents uh, and what's, you know, what is it that they do? Um, there's a collection at the end of this. Uh, we'll be able to get the slides. And so I don't want to go too into details for these, but you know, so we can go back over them. But we'll, we'll go through this briefly about uh, when you might use each of these agents. So phenylephrine is an agent that constricts peripherally, uh, not only in your arms and legs and, and gut, but also within your pulmonary vasculature. And that can be important when you're dealing with a large pulmonary embolism or right heart failure, a right side or right side coronary occlusion. If the right heart is weak, increasing uh, phenylephrine and increasing per pulmonary vascular resistance might make it harder uh, for the right side of the heart. Vasopressin, uh, on, on the other hand, has no receptors within the lungs. So this is a, a pure peripheral uh, vasopressor. Uh, you can use it in as conditions like hepatorenal syndrome or distributor shock and uh, neurogenic shock as well to you know, really uh, squeeze down peripherally in the tone making sure that you're not doing it so much that it'll actually cut off blood supply to the intestines, uh, which is certainly a risk. Uh, epinephrine is uh, that fight or flight uh, response. Uh, it's standard of care for cardiac arrest, uh, low doses and heart failure, uh, and anaphylaxis, status asthmaticus for, for the reasons you can see here. The status asthmaticus is gonna help increase the bronchodilators uh, and it's gonna, in cardiac arrest, induce uh, faster conduction through the, the conduction pathway in the heart. It's going to increase myocardial contractility and hopefully resuscitate the failing heart. Uh, the risk you run into these with, with uh, epinephrine itself is, as you can imagine, uh, tachydysrhythmias uh, or, or increased myocardial demand if someone's having a myocardial infarction and there's a lack of blood flow because that coronary artery is blocked, increasing the demand there may make that a little bit worse. So uh, it's important to consider the, the degree of injury uh, before starting this in somebody who's having uh, a coronary event. Uh, norepinephrine is uh, really the first line in almost every type of shock. And in those where it's not first line, it's a great second line agent. So uh, norepi is uh, what I would recommend as a good starting presser for, for any shock situation. Uh, typically, it's recommended to first line in sepsis, followed by vasopressin. Uh, and it's really... Uh, the best place to start, and usually typically uh, readily available within emergency departments or, or ICUs, um, it's, it's helpful in cardiogenic shock, in, in distributive shock, and uh, it can be given at, at a low concentration uh, for a short period of time. Uh, can sometimes be given peripherally, uh, but that's you know it still does require uh, a central line. Uh, Dibutamine uh, is we're getting into now the inotropes. Uh, this has an element of increased myocardial contractility, and in order to help increase cardiac output, also dilates the, the blood vessels peripherally. Uh, the, the thing to watch for this is that in patients who are hypotensive from their failing heart, they may just need more squeeze, but you have to have to consider that their blood pressure may continue to drop. So to balance those effects, a lot of times we'll start dibutamine with a low-dose vasopressin in the background. So just kind of temper out you know, the degree of peripheral uh, dilation. Uh, this can also be helpful in uh, pulmonary hypertension and when there's decreased flow from the right side of the heart to the left. And you really want to just encourage the myocardium to push a little bit harder. Uh, but that's something you may need to also uh, augment with, with that vasopressin, uh, again, to, to limit the effects on the, the pulmonary vasculature, but also allow uh, a, in the peripheral uh, tone to stay uh, intact. Milrinone acts in a very similar way. Uh, there's data between milrinone and dibutamine. Uh, arguably, some the, there's arrhythmias with both of them, neither of which are really clinically significant. Uh, milrinone does build up in renal failure, and so that may be a consideration. 
uh, but it works essentially in the same way and has the same considerations. Um, isoproteranol and levosimendin are elements that, are, that, that aren't really available in the United States and, and certainly very rarely in the, in the emergency department. So we're just going to skip over those. Uh, and then dopamine is used to be the go-to uh, vasoactive agent uh, in um, decades ago, but because it's sort of an early and, and dirty drug, it acts on so many receptors in so many different ways. The response is going to be very unpredictable. And so it's, it's something that I would use as a fourth line agent if you really just cannot get someone's blood pressure under control. Uh, but when dopamine is being added to me, that's that's a marker of, of needing either mechanical circulatory support or uh, just you know an, an, an unsurvivable event. Um, the arrhythmia problems with dopamine are much more significant than any of the other agents, uh, and they can also cause problems of peripheral hypotension uh, in, in an unpredictably dose-dependent way. So, so really, if you have two in, so on a desert island or a zombie apocalypse, it's it's acceptable. But uh, I would I would caution against using it first line uh, for anything. So, uh, things to consider and risks that you're you're undertaking by starting vasoactive agents um, is using dopamine and uh, not titrating to what's going on ph physiologically. So you need to match that physiologic effect and follow those markers of an organ perfusion such as your lactate, urine output, mental status, base excess. Uh, those are going to tell you whether you're getting enough oxygen flowing to your, your big toe, the distal nephron, uh, and, and you know, your, your deep, deep uh, cerebrum. Um, if you're having ongoing infusions, uh, despite uh, evidence of distal malperfusion, so uh, if you're increasing, increasing, increasing doses and you're getting signs of uh, peripheral tissue necrosis, fingers can can start to die if you increase the pressures too much, um, especially uh, usually seen with vasopressin and norepinephrine when they get to very high doses. Uh, sometimes that's you know, the shock is so profound, it's so bad, and the peripheral vasculature is, is what we call vasoplegic, that you need these high doses and some amount of distal tissue loss is expected, but that, that really should be uh, an unusual event. It shouldn't be just an accepted side effect. Um, and, and increasing those doses sometimes can be so high, and I've seen this before, that in vasopressin gets turned up so high that it's actually causing an obstructive shock. So you get you're beyond that uh, element of helping, you're actually just squeezing too hard that the poor heart can't, can't beat against it. Um, so in, in those kind of uh, cases, you may need some inotropy, uh, especially the high spinal cord injury. We have uh, uh, impaired uh, you know, tone to, to the myocardium. Um, and then using things like uh, beta agonists in patients who are having a tachy dysrhythmia, such as AFib with RDR uh, or SVT, that can actually make it worse. So you want to avoid agents that have a chronotropic effect in patients who are having uh, conduction or, or heart rate issues. And peripheral uh, vascular access is, is okay. Uh, typically, uh, the data has been more behind phenylephrine, and for a short time, less than less than an hour or so for norepinephrine, uh, that's been acceptable so long as it's not a high concentration dose. Uh, but it's a very real risk that when these, uh, if the IV fails and these elements go into the soft tissues, this will cause you know, a significant problem that needs skin grafting or surgeries. So uh, while you shouldn't wait to initiate pressors to have central access, you can start some peripherally. Central access should be obtained very quickly. And, and as budding emergency physicians, this is something that is going to be very straightforward for us. And so I, I would recommend getting it started, getting the line, getting it transitioned over uh, as expeditiously as you can. So and that's a lot of information. It's summarized here uh, for those who are chart oriented. Um, and this is this is taken straight from, from MCRIT, which is a great resource for all of these things. And uh, I'll leave you here. Uh, with a QR code that will take you to a copy of a PDF of these slides uh, for the, the diagrams. So I think those might be uh, often helpful in figuring out what's going on with my patient, what type of shock are we in, and how can we best uh, choose the, the, the right acting medication for the right type of shock. Uh, I don't, uh, that's where I'll end.